Last Sunday afternoon in studying John, we studied about worshiping God in spirit and in truth. This morning's lesson, we'll just call it words of exhortation. We will in a little bit be looking at Hebrews 10, Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 25. But my remarks uh, before that are to lay the groundwork for getting into those verses. And so we take a look at the writer of Hebrews and up or to the book itself. And up until the chapter 10, the writer has offered all kinds of doctrinal arguments to encourage faithfulness and steadfastness among the brethren. If you break the book down, you'll find Hebrews 1 and verse 1, all the way through chapter 8, verse 6. He spent his time showing the superiority of God's Son, Jesus Christ. And from chapter 8, verse 7, all the way through chapter 10, verse 18, he held up the superiority of the New Testament over the Old Testament. And beginning with Hebrews 10 and verse 19, the author starts to make the application of what he's been saying. And he does it through a series of exhortations and warnings that he sets out in the form of premises, actually. And they compose the remaining part of the letter to the Hebrews. In verses 19 through 25, the inspired writer exhorts them to faithfulness by pointing out their need. Number one, to draw near to God. Number two, hold fast your faith in God, Christ, the gospel system. And number three, the obligation they had toward their brothers and sisters to stimulate one another in love and good works. Always remember that while the Bible says we're to be ready unto every good work, that is Christians are, members of the Lord's church, we have to let the New Testament, Jesus himself, in other words, Tell us what the good works are that Christians are to involve themselves. All three are based upon, that is, draw near to God, hold fast your faith, stimulate one another to love and good works. All three are based upon what Christ has done and will do for us. Of course, he points out that he ever liveth to make intercession for us, and that goes on even now. If you ask me the details of that, I can't tell you. <laughs> but I can talk about what it means to make intercession. That's something one does on behalf of others or another. And that he's doing for us because he's the head of the church. He's added each member of the church to the church upon their obedience to the gospel and being baptized to Christ. He's deeply concerned about the church. When I see Jesus standing at the right hand of God at the time of Stephen's terrible death, I see someone who's concerned about you and about me, if you're members of the church. You're, here, you're God's children. He's our elder brother. Yes, head of the church, having all authority. But he loved us in shedding his blood to cleanse us from our sins and to purchase this church to which he adds us and of which he alone is the head. So inspiration begins with, let us draw near in faith, verses 19 through 22. And that's a very important point to keep in mind. Let us draw near in faith. Notice in verse 19, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Christ, Notice boldness to enter in. When you from the heart obey that form of doctrine which was delivered you in being 
uh, made free from sin, Romans 6, 17, and 18, by being baptized into Christ. All of that's preceded, of course, by your belief, and your repentance, and confession of faith in Christ. We can honestly approach God without shame. We have all boldness. And that's the kind of thing we need to remind ourselves of. We can approach the throne of God. We can approach right where, if you please, Christ is ruling at the right hand of God. In Hebrews 9, verses 11 and 12, the Scripture says, But Christ being come and high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained redemption for us. So he's gone into the very presence of God himself. Verse 24 of chapter 9 uh, says, For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God. Now look at that. For us. Need to pick me up? What does the eternal word do for his children, members of the church, the blood-bought institution? He's in the presence of the Father, and he is appearing before him for us. Again, don't ask me the details, but it's for your good and my good spiritually that he's there as the only mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ. So we have this boldness. What does it mean, boldness? Well, we have great confidence. This tests our faith in God and Christ and the gospel system. And that's in Hebrews 10, verse 19. Notice with a true heart, with all sincerity. We're serious about this, that we call living the Christian life in the Lord's church. Hebrews 10, in verse 22. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled with, from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Notice in full assurance of faith, no doubts. There's no reason for the faithful child of God to doubt anything regarding his salvation. Hebrews 10 and verse 22 again. So implied, I think, too in this is all that the Bible teaches concerning our prayers to the Father and the importance of prayers we petition the Father the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much, James says. So this is the need to draw near to God in prayer. Hebrews 4 and verse 16 makes that pretty clear. All of these things work for your good and my good to help us be what the New Testament says God wants the church to be. Remember, the church is His family. So He wants us to have this confidence and this sincerity and no doubts in our minds. Again, I remind you of the first epistle of John where he says over and over again, something like 24, 25 times, hereby we know thus and so. We're enlightened by the Word. It's the Word of Christ. We can have full assurance. God never meant for His children to be full of doubt and to question and say, is this really true or whatever. Now, what's the basis of this exhortation? Where we're able to enter into God's presence. Now, I want to pause here and say, remember what we said about Christ contrasting under the New Testament, worshiping God in spirit and in truth, with worshiping according to the law of Moses from the heart? Both of them require worshiping from the heart. Both of them require minds being set upon God and being governed by the truth. Well, what makes the worship, as we said last Sunday afternoon, what makes the worship of the Christian different? We have a higher plane. It's more on the plane of what God is, spiritual. It's spiritual. So we're able to enter into God's presence. Jesus consecrated a new and living way, as he says, through the veil, Hebrews 10, 19 through 20. So we have a new way to approach God in heaven through one who lives. And that was a very important point to make at that time, especially with the Jews who had long done what they had did in approaching God under the law of Moses. They had to learn different from that. And I call, call, ask you to call to mind the, the confused state for a while 
that Nicodemus had concerning the new birth. They had such a revolutionary change to go on in their mind. So this is made possible by the blood of Jesus, by His flesh, His death on the cross. So as I said earlier, Jesus now serves as a high priest over the house of God. Hebrews 10 and verse 21. What does that mean? Well, it helps to understand what a high priest is. He's able to come to our aid, according to Hebrews 2, 17 through 18. He understands your plight. You might say he understands your hurts. He understands what makes you fearful. He understands what, what makes you doubt. He understands our human frailties. And the gospel system takes care of that. So he sympathizes with our weaknesses, which means we as Christians should sympathize with our brethren's weaknesses. I think one of the biggest mistakes we make is when we think, oh, I can make this on my own. Well, that just won't work. We all need one another. The church is a living organism made up of individuals who have all given themselves to God. So he ever lives to intercede on our behalf, as I said a while ago, Hebrews 7, 24 and 25. But we're able to enter God's presence. That's a wonderful thing. Think of all these billions of people in the world today and how many can actually enter into God's presence as the writer of Hebrews is talking about. What a privilege. It's a great obligation, but what a privilege and a blessing. We have had our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. Surely this is an allusion to the Old Testament practice of taking blood from the altar and consecrating the Levitical priests by sprinkling them with it. Exodus chapter 29 and verse 21. And thus these people, being Jews, having been converted, would certainly understand that. It is the blood of Christ that is truly efficacious in purging our conscience of sin. Hebrews 9, verse 14 reads, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered Himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? It's nice to have a good conscience. A conscience that eats at you all the time. It, yeah, well, it just causes big problems. And when you see the Word of God and know you're not living like it says, our conscience ought to hurt us. My prayer for people who are members of the church and they're caught up in a sin or just plain unfaithful, I hope their conscience eats them alive until they do what the Lord requires of them to once again be faithful. Jesus then now serves as a high priest over the house of God, Hebrews 10, 21. So he's able to come to our aid, according to the writer of Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17 and 18. So he sympathizes with our weaknesses, Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. You ever had somebody say, you just don't listen to me? You just don't understand You've never been where I've been. You just can't see it by way. You know, none of those things work with Jesus. He was tempted in every point like as we are yet without sin. He understands. And so we ought to draw as close to Christ by loving His will and doing it as a person possibly can. Especially since He ever lives to make intercession for us. When we consider these things, when it comes then down to assembly like this on the first day of the week, we would do well to ask the question, as we came toward this day, being Christians, what was on our mind about today? You know, most of the people in America today don't think a thing in the world about doing whatever they do on any other day on Sunday. They don't think anything about it. Going to assemble with people to worship is hardly there. Yes, I know they're the denominational people, but they're as apt to go on Saturday night as they are on Sunday. The authority of the New Testament is virtually nil in most people's lives. 
And that's why it's so strange when you have all of this being said about drawing near to Christ. Why the assembly in the first place? And yet you can't get brethren to see the importance of, of being in this assembly. It's a privilege. Think about what a blessing it is to be able to assemble and do those things the Lord teaches us to do in worship of God in this assembly. So we look forward to the day when we literally enter through the veil into, into heaven itself, into God's wonderful presence. But that's what we're doing now. If ever there is a time on earth when collectively we can assemble before God and put the world out of our mind, it's in the worship assembly on the first day of the week. Now, I'm not talking about your private devotions. I'm talking about the church collected together in an assembly like this to do what the New Testament says we're to do and the involvement of our minds in this. And therefore, you're going to see why we will end up where we end up and where the writer ends up in uh, these assemblies of exhortation. There's a day coming when we'll have one big gathering. We don't think about that. If I don't like to gather with the saints here, if I'm not that careful about that, if it's not that important to me, if I just go through the motions, if when I'm not there I don't really miss it and I'm happier doing something else, are we ready to enter into eternity and think that we can enter into the presence of God and all happiness and peace? So he says in verse 23, let us hold fast our hope. Hope is the expectation of heaven. Remove the expectation of heaven from our lives and what do you have? You have nothing. We're exhorted to hold the fa how fast the confession of our hope. He's already taught in Hebrews 6, 19, chapter 7, verse 19, that in Christ we have a far better hope than the Jew ever did under the law of Moses. In Hebrews 3, 12 through 13, and in uh, chapter 4, verse 11, he's saying, but there's a danger of apostasy. As long as we're in this life, we have to be vigilant. Peter makes it clear, likely writing to a lot of these same people. When he talks about the devil as a roaring lion goeth about who's our adversary, seeking whom may devour. That's a reality. Thus you want to draw closer to God as you possibly can. Well, when you forsake the assembling of ourselves together, you're cutting off one of the greatest avenues of being close to God. So we must hold fast, according to Hebrews 3, 6, 14, and chapter 4, 14. We must hold fast. We must hold fast that hope of heaven that we confess. If somebody asks you right now, when you die, where do you expect to go? Well, there should be no hesitancy on our part. Heaven. You expect to go somewhere else? If you do expect to go somewhere else, that means you know there's something in your life that's contrary to the way God wants you to live. And you know it, and you know you need to be doing something about it. So we're to hold fast without wavering. Hebrews 10, 23. Some people are just vacillators. <laughs> they just wobble. See, you little wibbly wobbly fella. When it comes to the faith, they're on one day and off the next, and you never know. That doesn't characterize the Christian according to the teaching of the New Testament. The writer of Hebrews knew that. And here's a good reason to heed the exhortation. The faithfulness of God for he who promised is faithful. Hebrews 10.23 I like that. A lot of people mean to do things for you. But because of human frailties, weaknesses, they can't. They cannot do so. God won't fail us. You can have people who love you greatly, who mean very well, have the best of intentions. Remember what roads paid with those. But because of their human limitations, they fail us. But God won't fail us, Hebrews 13, 5. So we need to emulate the faith of Sarah of old who judged him faithful who had promised, Hebrews 11 and 11. There's why she conceived. She believed God. We can depend upon God to keep his promise. I know that. I never doubt that. It never crosses my mind that God's not going to keep his promise. I'll tell you what crosses my mind. 
under any and all circumstances, situation, and places, will I be faithful to him. I stood before a group of brethren a long time ago and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And that qualified me to be baptized in Christ, having first repented and believed in Christ, of course. How did I mean that? Well, I assure you, I think a whole lot more about what that means now and over the years it did when I was 12 and a half years old and obeyed the gospel. Nevertheless, I meant it then. I mean it now. It just there's a whole lot more to my meanness <laughs> now than there was then. You'll have to define how I use that in that context. As we draw near to God and behold fast our hope, we're not alone in doing so. We're to be mindful of each other and how we are doing. Consider one another. That's in Hebrews 10, verse 24. Let us consider one another. Do we consider one another in the context that's right here? When someone absents himself from the assembly, are we aware of it? Maybe they're sick. Maybe they're out of town or whatever. But it also ought to say something to those who are going to absent themselves when they know. They should know that we'll be concerned and they will be letting us know that they're not going to be here and they know it. We're a family, aren't we? Family of God. Now, when you were growing up in your family or in your family now, there's times when you expect people there. And when they don't show up, what's gone? Where is he? Got the table set. Where is he? He knew we ate at whatever time. Well, why don't we have the same attitude toward our brothers and sisters in Christ? So with a view to incite, and that's what it means, or to spur on, to stir up, then we're to do it in love and good works. And this reminds us of all kinds of exhortations throughout the Bible. For us to be active in the kingdom, doing what Christians do. Now, this brings us all the way down to where I was going in the first place. And that is to verse 25. When we assemble to worship God, that's the primary reason we assemble. But there's underlying reasons that are brought out. When we're worshiping God according to His will, in spirit and in truth, in an assembly like this on the first day of the week, as we engage in the songs, as we engage in prayer, as we observe the Lord's Supper, as we give of our means, which our mind to do that should have started before we ever got to the worship period, as we study as we're studying now, all those things are exhorting us to faithfulness. Think of the songs we sing. Think of the prayers we pray. We're all at one as we pray, as we partake the Lord's Supper, showing forth His death that He come again. On this commonality, in this fellowship that we have that nobody else has out in the world. So an important purpose of our assembling is to stir one another up to love and good works. Again, I know we have come to worship God, but this is a side point that we're to exhort one another. Thus, I like the idea of these are assemblies of worship, yes, but they're also assemblies of exhortation to provoke one another unto love and good works. Just think of a sermon. What's it designed to do if it's scriptural? To provoke the people who hear it by the message in it. It's to obeying the gospel of various things about the church and our duty to God as a member of the church. We miss all of that when we're not that concerned about the assembly. So we must not become guilty of forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. At that time, he says, as the banner of some is. And that word forsake means to abandon, to desert, to stop assembling with the saints altogether. There are things happen that will cause you not to be able to be here. I think I mentioned when I was sick last fall, I missed more services then. I have a whole life. Well, I didn't like that. It felt like my whole world was turned upside down. Well, I'm glad it felt that way. Because that meant at least one thing, that I was 
used to assembling with the saints. It was a part of my life, and that's what I wanted to do. And some evidently had done so at this time. He says, as the manner of some is. And they needed the exhortation of assembling with the saints to worship God and all that went on in that worship. Exhorting one another through assembling. It's so very important. He says, as you see the day approaching. There's two different schools on that. The coming of Christ, the end of the world, or the coming of destruction in Jerusalem. I personally think it was as their whole life and culture was about to be destroyed as far as Jews are concerned. I think it really aimed more at the structure of Jerusalem. But that doesn't mean whichever way you take it, that you miss the point. That is to appreciate the value and the necessity of assemblies of exhortation. Because when you begin to miss them and view the very nature of them, that's indicative of apostasy on your part. A person has to reach a low ebb before they start missing. They don't want to be here. It's boring to them. Well, what does that say about what's already happened in their life? So when a person starts missing, then there's a problem. And it's been there a long time. Sort of like a cancer. When it really appears or starts to hurt, it didn't just do that overnight. It started working on a person a long time before that. And if we can recognize that when it comes to various diseases, how much more so spiritual disease? So what's our conclusion? Well, we draw near to God in full assurance of faith. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God, Romans 10, 17. We walk by faith and not by sight, 2 Corinthians 5, 7. We live as the Word of God teaches us. We're interested in doing everything we do, thought, word, and action, by the authority of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who sits at the right hand of God, ever living, to make intercession for us. We hold fast the confession of our hope. We don't deviate. We don't turn to the right hand or the left. And we consider one another, brothers and sisters in Christ, to stir up each other to love God, to love the things of God, to love the brethren, and to be involved in the good works that are peculiar to the church that Jesus authorized. His motivation to heed this exhortation, we are reminding here of the new and living way. Without Christ having done what He did, we couldn't do what we're doing right now. We need to realize by Christ doing what He did, we can do what we're doing. That's pretty special. The high priest who now serves for us, oh, the house of God is Jesus Christ. How we've been consecrated through having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. We were baptized to Christ for the remission of our sins. Then we are children of God. So he's promised to be faithful to us. He's not going to go back on his promises. So as we close the lesson, if we truly appreciate the blessings we now have in Christ, we will do all that we can to draw closer to God. Hold fast that hope which we confess and utilize the opportunities we have to encourage one another in love and good works. That's being faithful to the Lord. Be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So when you read Hebrews 10.25, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Exhorting one another. Think about the song we're about to sing. It's going to exhort people who need to obey the gospel to obey it. It's going to exhort people by the message in the song to those who may be members of the church and need to change. They need to repent. It's going to exhort them to do that. And all these other songs we sing, and our just being together of like-mindedness, it's going to help us to fight the fight of faith, living our lives as living sacrifices through the rest of the week. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, then we invite you to come to Him while we stand and sing.